Good evening, everybody. I'm Betsy Fisher Martin, the Executive Director of the Women in Politics Institute at American University. And welcome to our virtual series, Women on Wednesdays. We are so glad you could join us for our kickoff event of the fall. To those of you new to one of our events, WPI is a nonprofit and nonpartisan institute in AU's School of Public Affairs that aims to close the gender gap in political leadership. And we offer academic and practical campaign training and facilitate research and of course, discussions like this on women in politics. And tonight we have the honor of speaking to a trailblazer in the political arena, the first female Senator elected to represent the state of Minnesota, Amy Klobuchar. She has written a new book entitled The Joy of Politics, Surviving Cancer, a Campaign, a Pandemic, an insurrection and life's other unexpected curveballs. And she is going to talk to us about all of those curveballs and the lessons learned in her successful career in politics that has included 17 years and counting in the US Senate uh, and a run of course for the White House in 2020 where she came in third in the New Hampshire primary and ended up on Joe Biden's shortlist for VP. And she's also, of course, the chairwoman of the Senate Rules Committee. Um, and we are delighted that she could be with us uh, tonight. Uh, before we do start, I wanna let everybody know that I'm gonna save some extra time for your questions. We have more than 300 folks registered for uh, the event tonight. So I'll save some extra time. So please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A box and I will uh, get to as many of those as possible. And of course, um, if you miss any of the discussion or you want to share it with friends, the replay is going to be available on our website or on our Crowdcast site of archive programs. We'll put a link to that, of course, in the chat and distribute it on our social media channels. So with that, Senator, welcome. Well, thank you. Thanks, Betsy. I'm kind of psyched that we're doing a remote book event. It does bring back <laughs> memories, but also makes it easy for a lot of people to attend. So I exactly, am, yeah, you know, and I was we have a, a great turnout. You're, you're doing uh, at AU uh, with the and the uh, women on Wednesdays. Couldn't have a better name. Nice alliteration. Yeah. <laughs> great well, thanks. Thanks for being part of it, and congratulations on the book. Um, I wanted to start because. You finished up this book in January of this year mm -hmm. in the aftermath of a very volatile midterm campaign season. And I wanted to ask a question that you ended up actually posing in the book to yourself um, toward the end when you write, and I quote, why pick this particular moment in time to write a book about the joy in politics? And you added, as in how Pollyannish, how dumbheaded, how completely naive can you be, end quote. <laughs> so tell us how you answered that question. Well, uh, for me, actually, there is always, you know, I went through a lot just like America did during the time period of the book uh, with everything from the pandemic to the divisiveness in the politics. Uh, in my mm -hmm. case, my husband got seriously sick with COVID, ends up in the hospital. I had my dad died. I had just... But it wasn't that much difference than what a lot of people went through. And then the insurrection uh, and the like. Um, but through it all, I decided, yes, you got to be realistic about the setbacks um, and lament them. But we need to also rejoice in the comebacks. And America did have a comeback. Our economy's in a comeback, always with its challenges. Um, our politics, uh, we still had vibrant elections in the midterms and people really turned out to vote and rejected election deniers. Um, and all those things matter. Um, I will, there is one funny like postscript to the name of the book. And uh, and some of it's, by the way, Hubert Humphrey was also known as the happy warrior. There's a new book, mm -hmm. on, by the way, uh, that's out. Um, and by Sam Friedman. And he was always known as a happier warrior and talked a lot about the joy of our politics. And that was at an equally hard time, right? Uh, in the in the late 60s, mid 60s, sure. early 60s. And I do think you just have to, as a leader, no matter what field you're in, no matter um, where you are in your life, it's really important to try to keep uh, your eye on, without being Pollyannish, but on the positive and the accomplishments. Uh, but the funny story on the side is that when the book was announced this fall, it happened to be announced the same day as Bernie's book. And my book is called 
the joy of politics. And Bernie's book is called It's Okay to Be Angry at Capitalism. And so Bernie <laughs> thought this was super funny. And as we got into December and I was desperately trying to get this Afghan refugee bill done, uh, yeah. for these incredible people that have helped our soldiers. And I've got VFW, American Legion, Lindsey Graham is the lead author. And I still was getting obstacles and I, I think I will get it done. But I was getting so mad at trying to find a way to get it done as well as another bill I had, a journalism tech bill. And Bernie kept coming up to me on the floor and looking at me and going, where's the joy? I don't <laughs> see the joy. Where's the joy? Um, and so part of what I'm doing with this book is answering that question, the joy yeah. and results when everyone had counted us out and we got the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill done and we got the chips bill done, we got the uh, pharma negotiations, something I'd been working on for years. And um, we voted nearly unanimously to get uh, Finland and Sweden into NATO. All these things happened in like three months after years of work um, and many of them bipartisan uh, mm -hmm. many of them involving the leadership of the president. And so anyway, there is joy in that. And we got to remember that. And certainly there's joy in helping your constituents um, when they're at the like last thing. They've tried every agency, they're like their social security check isn't there or some uh, veteran. Uh, that I had one guy that he literally lost his leg serving overseas. Mm. And then the military said there was no proof. He didn't have a leg. Um, and I was able to fix that. So there's endless stories of, I think, for all elected officials at every level of government of when you actually mm -hmm. help someone directly. And that still goes on as a U.S. senator. Right. I want to show um, the cover of the book again, because this is, of course, that iconic shot of you um, announcing your bid for the presidency in, I think it was February of 2019, on a day that was not supposed to have any snow. <laughs> no. Um, but I mean, you sort of embrace that joy there, freezing with not even any Bernie mittens on, right? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. it really showed kind of, I think, the grit and the theme of your campaign in many ways, right? Exactly. And I, for me, like, we, wasn't even supposed to snow that day. I was more worried that some one yeah. of our one of my constituents would get frostbite that was there, or, you know, we'd have some incidents with these little fire pits going. Um, and, but the snow was just unexpected and it was this really heavy snow, which showed up on mm -hmm. TV and the media covered it like a train wreck ready to happen. And I literally, as I turned the pages of the speech um, and they were covered in plastic, there was so much snow that I would have to wipe them off. It was coming down so fast as I went through it. And one of the more amusing stories I told from that day was uh, the woman who has colored my hair for years she decided to come out before and she was in that little, a little warm-up tent and she was there and she cut my hair and she was there so she's out there and she later tells me a few weeks later she's like i was just out there praying and i'm like oh be be it's going well actually we're, we have a good start like you don't have to pray she goes no 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 I was praying because you didn't notice, but I saw a little gray coming in your part and I put a bunch of brown stuff in there and I was worried with all that snow that it was going to come dripping down your face on national TV. Now, it's also you would... kind of a predictive. It later happened to Rudy Giuliani. We don't know. I was going to say. <laughs> but that was because of heat, I think. Um, but anyway, that was just, I, it was so joyful to have actually, you know, my dad was still there before he yeah. died my family, uh, Abigail and John were up there, and just so many Minnesotans turned out in the middle of a blizzard. They literally were pulling their kids on sleds, thousands of people. So it was, it was a pretty magical way to begin a campaign. And as you said, we never had as much money as opponents didn't have the name ID, but we just kept going and really, really surprised people in terms of um, how we built the campaign with a great team, and also how we uh, we're able to focus, I, I think, correctly on issues that are still really relevant today and many yeah. of which uh, we've been uh, working on the last few years. Well, and of course, another hair story, you write about Trump dubbing you like, the snow woman. And then I think you replied on Twitter, well, how would your hair fare in a blizzard? Exactly, which I don't think <laughs> the answer is not very well. But yes, I, <laughs> I wrote that myself in the airport. <laughs> but that gets me to like the question of, and you write candidly about this, 
the kind of the thick skin that it takes to run for office, along with, you know, acknowledging that possibility of failure. And I think, you know, maybe even more so for women. Um, talk about that decision to run in what you, you know, admitted was kind of a long shot race and your, mm -hmm. your decision to sort of take that risk. Yeah. Well, a lot of it was, I felt that I had some important things to say and important mm -hmm. issues to focus on. I come from the middle of the country. Um, and I think that for the first time, the public was able to see not just one or even two women on the stage. We literally tripled the number of women in the um, any primary Democrat Republican combined on two consecutive debate nights. Like that was it. And we had all these women, including Kamala. Yeah, here's that. Here's all the women. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that was just, those are those two nights. Oh, cool. Look at that photo. Yeah, of all the um, debates. Um, and it was just a major shift. And it made it makes people think differently, even when you put in the hat in the ring, like, wait, look, not everyone's the same. They have different views. They look different. They come from different places. Um, and I thought that was really, really important. But that wasn't the core of why I ran. I ran just because I thought I'd be a good president. Um, and I thought I could get things done. And one of the unique things we did, we did like, hundred things we were going to get done in the first hundred days. We were very forward looking, um, which I think given those years of Donald Trump, people really needed, needed to hear about. And, um, but overall that was, it was very unique that we had all the women. I mean, you remember the days when Hillary was uh, running and you, they didn't even, she couldn't even make it to the bathroom and back because they hadn't planned it. Remember that one debate? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you so point we, out too that Right. Those six women, you know, in history, you know, there had never been more than five, you know, ever having appeared on a debate stage. Yeah, and so, that and was so do you think about, I mean, you, you sort of alluded to this, but, you know, that kind of imaging to young girls, I think of even Elizabeth Warren and the messaging that she gave about young girls, um, that that's going to pay off here. And when we think about more women in politics and maybe having a, a woman president. Right. Because remember, it's not all about president. It's also about people running, and that's how you get started: school board and city council, and on up. Um, and I was the first woman elected Senate, Minnesota. I was the first woman county attorney in our biggest county, um, and so I kind of I've had that history of knowing that it makes a difference when uh, they see you in those jobs. And I've had um, just incredible as all women in elected office have, regardless of party experience of people coming up and saying, I was an intern, you know, and now I'm, I'm doing this in politics. So I did this and it's, yeah. it's really cool to see, to see that happen. I remember when I had my first elected job as county attorney, I had my two, I, I hired two women deputies and they'd never had a woman for our biggest county in that job, DA. And then here I have these two women deputies who we go out to lunch and we're sitting there and this waiter comes over and he says, how are you, they had never met each other. So we're like planning this. How are you three little gals doing? Are you taking a break from work? And I'm like, no, I am woman county attorney. These are my two deputies. <laughs> I'm going to be running the biggest law enforcement office in the state. Do you have any other questions? But I I, uh, I do think over time that has, has improved, but it's still, you know, it's a quarter of the women in the Senate. I remember uh, being on the Trevor Noah show and a few years ago, it's very funny. And I was going through how at that moment in time, in the history of the Senate, there'd been 2000, almost 2000 men. And like at the time, like 56 women and half of them were there at that moment. And he mm -hmm. pauses, he goes, if a nightclub had numbers that bad, they'd shut it down. Um, and, <laughs> so you know, true. but we're not shutting down the doors. We're opening, you know, you had Speaker Pelosi and you have, uh, women leaders emerging all over the place. So, you know, I think that that, that has been a major shift. And I think the women yeah. that are coming up that are maybe watching this today um, have more role models to to um, than than certainly I did. I had Jen, when I was running for county attorney. Um, no, maybe it was when I was running for Senate. No, county attorney. I had Jan Janet Napolitano maybe was the AG and um, and Kathleen Sebelius was the uh, governor of Kansas. <laughs> I saw on their website that they had all these like plans and goals. 
And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna have my plans. And this uh, woman who advises women on running for office, she had came up with this like great line. When you're a women candidate, um, um, you have to, now some of this isn't true anymore, speak softly and carry a big statistic off of speak <laughs> softly and carry a big statistic. Because men can sometimes go, hey, I did this. Yeah. Women have to actually show um, the numbers and showed what they did. And that's what I did through my time in politics. I made sure that I got things done and showed results. Um, my reelection for county attorney, I remember the shirt said um, something like, you know, action results or, you know, all of this. It was all about results because oftentimes you just can't run on image or on looking cool. Right. This is my favorite picture from the debates, though, which is just kind of. <laughs> You know, the, the perfect illustration of sort of our situation sometimes in politics, <laughs> the, yes, the guys are that, screaming at the top of their lungs and yeah. you're sitting there in the middle of it all, right? Yes, that was a great, great memory, though they were debating about some kind of prison issues. And one of the funny backstories is maybe you're, because um, you maybe don't want to end up, you know, with, with someone punching in your face because they're yelling at each other. Um, especially you see how close Dyer is there. Yeah. So I, you normally might react by stepping back some, but at that point, at the end, I think Elizabeth and I were the only two women left on that stage. And uh, Pete and I were the only two of average height, honestly. And so I was the only one that used a little like two inch riser. So I didn't look so short. So if I had backed away, it's one thing to get on the riser at the beginning. Oh, yeah. The other two in the middle of the debate sort of stumble off the riser. Um, and so I chose to just stay where I was. Um, and that was why that picture took place where I'm just standing right there in the middle of they yelled at each other. Yes, that happened. You didn't want to have the, remember the Gary Bauer moment when he was like flipping pancakes in New Hampshire and fell off the back yeah, of the those stage? Kinds of things. You, you do try it's to like avoid, avoid. Man or woman, you try to avoid those moments. Yes. Avoid those moments. But going back to, you know, you talked about running for Senate um, for the, the, in that, that first race of yours um, and kind of results driven you write about, you know, you had a team of volunteers with going through the, the parades and the streets with brooms um, to symbolize kind of sweeping in change. Um, but talk about that decision, because you were, um, you know, certainly uh, very young. You hadn't been um, run statewide before. Wow. I mean, look at your daughter there, how tiny she is. <laughs> Yeah. But talk about that decision to run and was there um, folks that encouraged you to do that? What was your support system and how did you kind of take that leap? Yeah, so I uh, was, as you know, at the county attorney now, it was yeah. about, um, it th that particular county was about the fourth of the population of the state. So, you know, it was the biggest one by far. And I had... Um, had, you know, about 400 people working for me, high profile jobs. So people knew me. It was two congressional mm -hmm. districts. So it wasn't quite what it sounded. And I had done it for eight years and been involved mm -hmm. in it. prosecuted a judge who ripped off a woman with disabilities, like a lot of high profile things. And so, uh, so I was known but I hadn't, as you know, I hadn't been in the legislature, I hadn't been in Congress. Actually, the job I had was nonpartisan on the ballot, even though I was Democratic endorsed. Um, and so, but I actually had seen what we had done. Like, as I said, we had these plans and I'd have numbers and I'd show what we did, how long it had been taking way too long to do some cases involving repeat property offenders and all this stuff. And I was able to show the numbers and get results. And maybe it was naive, but I thought, well, we need some of that in Washington. And this is what I want to bring there. And I want to do this. Now, Walter Mondo was my mentor because he mm -hmm. had a former vice president um, who's beloved. He, um, he I'd worked with him at my law firm for years. So I remember calling him with the reasons why I was running and he wanted a 30 second elevator speech. And so I would call him and I'd give him the 30 second elevator speech. He goes, that's not good enough. And he'd hang up. Wow. <laughs> and then I'd try again. And so, um, so I had, I want to 
stress again that having those kinds of mentors is really, really important. So it was a leap, but I don't think it was as big a leap. Maybe it seemed like for people in Washington, they're like, who is she? I can't pronounce her name. I call people for money one August, just like the last month we had in the year and a half before the election, no one would call me back, no one could pronounce my name. And I finally actually resorted to looking through all my phone numbers from the past. Back then we had, you know, address books and right. finding all the numbers of everyone I ever know. And that is when I set what is still an all time Senate record. I raised seventeen thousand dollars from ex boyfriends. That's and so great. <laughs> my husband has pointed out it's not an expanding base. Um, and so it is a lesson to everyone to try to keep good relations, you know, when relationships end. But I um, was, it seemed like not as big a leap as I've said in Minnesota, but probably for national people, they're like, what is this? And then I did well in the debates. We had a number of Democrats running. I went all over the state. I got the endorsements of a number of uh, greater Minnesota outstate um, members of Congress that was important. And I, learned a lot about ag policy and um, just mm -hmm. a lot of things that put me in the place. So that was my other advice, actually, in addition to having thick skin, being ready for crazy, weird things happening and people going after you. Um, uh, the other thing is just to know your stuff. And you don't right. have to, there's this old thing about women candidates think they have to know everything. And I tell the funny story in the book about how a legislator was recruiting two people to run in a swing district. And the um, woman said, I don't think I can do this. I don't know enough about trade policy. And the, the man said, well, I drive a Volvo that was made in America, so I know enough, I can do it. I think there is that gender difference on that, but at the same time, mm -hmm. and maybe because of that, for me, I felt like I better know, I really better know my stuff, especially when I wasn't in federal office. So I just- right learned everything so that when I announced and I kind of just did it a few hours every day. And so that when I announced, I felt I could handle most questions. And then of course I did more and more and I used the same approach. But by the time I ran for president, I've been in the Senate for a number of years. So I felt like I was pretty up to speed on the issues, but I would always just keep going back and looking at new things and, and that you're better at governing if you know things, right? So the campaign right, right. are a way to learn things to govern. I wanted to ask you, and this is kind of a, a funny illustration of a, of a larger point, but you tell the story in the book um, just about, you know, the treatment that um, women generally will have in the media. And this is the, you tell the story in the book, and this is a selfie that you took at the inauguration on, you know, right at, you know, on the, you know, dais of the. Uh, inauguration, a selfie oh, with right. McCain and, Ber and Bernie Sanders. And um, this was in 2017, right? So it was the, the Trump inauguration. And then, you know, the next day, um, you know, the, the caption, someone took a, a news photographer, took a photo of you taking the selfie. And the caption is woman takes selfie <laughs> with um, McCain and Sanders. And, you know, <laughs> yeah this is the kind of thing that you just want to scream about right it's exactly. uh, the senate senate are there taking a selfie yeah so that was pretty funny because that thing went viral the next day because remember yes. the day after the trump inauguration was the women's march so yeah. there were all these things of retweeting it with the words this is why we march um and so that was that was quite memorable and but the other piece of it was that moment is that somehow I end up, and they were both friends of mine from different walks of life, sitting between Bernie and John McCain, if you can imagine, Bernie, both of them having run for president, all three of us basically talking about it beforehand about how that, because you remember McCain just predicted all of this. Oh, about yeah. he was, and there we're just like, we got to do our jobs here. And you know, on inauguration, you try to come together. And just the darkening clouds were such a metaphor for what the speech was. It just got darker and darker. And um, McCain, who Trump had gone after for being a prisoner of war, if you remember this, saying he shouldn't have got caught or whatever. He shouldn't. And I still remember hoping McCain, because of his injuries from um, his 
in, when he was held as a prisoner of war and the beatings and the torture, he couldn't even get on his raincoat ever. And I knew this, he can't, couldn't mm. comb his hair. So I was right. helping him put that on, you know, while Trump is, is speaking. And McCain always irascibly hilarious at times as the people are filing up there and Bernie is just like, ah. and, and John is whispering to me, this is setting an all time record for the inauguration. I go for what? He goes, most money ever spent on plastic surgery on an inaugural stage. Oh um, so, yes. And so then as it goes on, he starts citing, you know, he, he because he was such a student of history, he yeah. knew that all of the, he knew what, um, lines from the speech where they reminded him of past speeches and I wish I had written it all down because he actually said the speeches and the years but I remember he said Mussolini and he said Huey Long and he was like going over dictators yeah it wasn't Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln uh, no so, so, so he was saying <laughs> yeah. that. and then when it ended the three of us walk out together and usually you sit, find something you you know because we everyone's done this in politics after inauguration like well yeah. I'm not sure. but this time we were just kind of speechless and a reporter asked us stuff and we hardly said anything at all um just because it was so dark and if any hope that you had that maybe this would be yeah. a moment he didn't even mention hillary's name in the right. speech so any anyone that thought while she's sitting there behind him showing respect by being there so anyone that thought it was going to be the cathartic moment, that was the first sign. And the second, of course, was the mm -hmm. speech he gave in front of the CIA wall of the um, of the uh, of the agents that had died that doesn't have their names, right. just the stars. And he right. gave a political speech about the size of the inaugural crowd the next day. And so that was after that. I'm like, wow. So um, well, and the uh, irony of the picture, too, is that, that yeah. Huh? The irony of that, the photo is that fast forward four years later, right? And you as ranking member on the Senate Rules Committee with Chairman Blunt were was the actual MC of the entire inauguration. <laughs> right, exactly. So you have that. The other irony is leading into that only a week before McCain had invited me with Lindsey Graham and the three of us, because yeah. he wanted to show his support for um, Georgia and for um, Latvia, Lithuania, um, and for Ukraine and Estonia. And we spent a New Year's Eve before that inauguration, John and Lindsay and me, on the front line with the previous president of Ukraine um, in the middle of this blizzard, because I'm always in blizzards, um, with, um, with people who had been widows of soldiers that had been the victim of sniper fire from Russia. Now, McCain picked to do that. He, wanted to do that trip to show our support for those countries because he knew um, and felt that Trump would be too aligned with Putin. Hmm. So, I mean, talk about everything coming around and him predicting, for sure. um, which a lot of people did, but McCain, I think, had unique knowledge and was a very, very close friend of mine, um, as is Bernie. So it was yeah. more to the picture than even the crazy thing that came out. Yes. Well, I also wanted to ask you, too, about the decision that you made to take yourself out of the running for VP, I mentioned at the beginning that you were on that short list, um, you know, after Biden as the nominee had said that he wanted to select a woman for uh, the role and you were interviewed, you tell a great story about prepping for the interview, reading all the Biden books. It was a Zoom interview, um, but talk, but it had to be, you know, so a tough pandemic, decision yes, for you. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, to after all of this um to decide to kind of step back from that talk about that decision well, if you remember the moment in our country it was after the george floyd murder in my state right uh, it was it was this moment in time and i i really felt strongly that when the country when trump was right, that numerous examples which we all know but we're also in the book just about how he was dividing the country based on race that he was doing all he could um, to use that issue, uh, that it was a moment to bring the country together uh, by putting a woman of color on the ticket, um, which is what I said to 
now President Biden. Um, and so that was what happened. And, you know, it's, I remember afterwards, my husband and I, after all that, the presidential, my husband almost dies of COVID. Uh, then oh. uh, then we have the uh, murder of George Floyd in my state, then this, and I start the book by uh, talking about how then in July, he and I took a uh, drive um, out to the Tetons where I'd gone uh, growing up in Wyoming um, and took this really, really long hike um, and um, just sort of reflecting on everything that had gone down. And one of the things was, cause I just had my hip replaced, whole nother story right before they stopped elective surgeries cause I had this condition and I got it replaced and four months later I'm on this hike and it started to hurt so much when I got to this, this 14 mile round trip hike. I get to this, the top, I was, we're supposed to be like solitude. And I tell the story of sitting on, I finally say to my husband, I'm not gonna do the last 20 minutes. I'm just gonna stay here. It's really nice here. The mountains are, I'll stay, you go up, you come down. And he's so used to me meeting every goal because I'm so competitive, big surprise. And he goes, no, no, you should mm -hmm. go. I'm like, no, 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 I'm just, I'm gonna sit on this rock. And so there I am like kind of feeling sorry for myself, honestly my hip, you know, yeah, eating this granola and with this blue scarf around my neck. And then these two kind of older people come up and they're really vigorous with their poles and I hear them crunching on the ice. <laughs> and cause I was afraid I was gonna like go down the ice, honestly. So they come crunching up and they're like, did you just stop here? Are you okay? I'm literally alone on a rock. I go, oh yeah. I said, I just got my hip replaced four months ago. And they go, that's the woman goes, it's extraordinary you're up this far. And I go, thank you. Yeah, isn't it kind of amazing? She goes up, then these two kids come down and this boy, this young boy, it's like he takes like the snow off his boots and he goes, lady, did you stop here and not go up to the lake? I go, yeah, it's really nice around here. <laughs> he goes, that's so cool. It's really overrated up there. It's covered in ice. It's much better here. So the whole lesson of that story was that it's what you learn on the journey. It's not always get that you get to the top. Not everyone does, but it's what you get, what you learn on the path, on the journey. Right. Um, and um, I hope that I've taken those lessons, both the defeats and the positives um, from the presidential and put them into action with the work I did, as you point out, on democracy, with uh, working with uh, Senator Blunt and, um, and Senator uh, Collins and Senator Manchin on the Electoral Count Act that we passed on leading the Freedom to Vote Act. Um, mm -hmm. That was so important on uh, the work that I've just done in general on elections. I think a lot of that has come out of these these last few years, as well as using the power that I got out of the presidential to help my uh, candidates that I like all around the country. Um, I think last Congress, I was number one for bipartisan bills and number three for passing bills, which sometimes when you get out of a presidential race, it's not quite like that. Uh, right. But I was able to be true to myself uh, in that campaign and then being able to make that adjustment to doing something else instead of crying in my milk all the time um, and um, try to do good. Well, we have a couple of, uh, we have several questions and a lot of them have to do with women running for office. So I'll start with a couple of those. Um, this one is from Alexis um, and she is asking, have you ever felt that you needed to ask, act more masculine to huh. get people to take you seriously? Huh. So I'm, I think I will say where I'm thinking back now, cause sort of you get used to how you're gonna be as time goes on. But mm -hmm. when I was the, basically the district attorney for eight years, I would be at these really hard meetings, press conferences about murder cases, the victims would come up and it's just horrific stories of, you know, kids seeing their mom beaten to death and just, and I would just always be like, I am not crying. I will not cry because I have to be mm -hmm. strong. And I, I don't think that was a weak thing to do. I think part of it was trying to be strong for the people who were crying. Um, and so I would work, but then what was wild about it was every time I went to a funeral, even when it was for like, maybe we had, I remember we had one domestic violence victim who her husband was from Russia and he dismembered a body. It was a horrible, horrible thing. And it was hor just the story of it. There were just, she had a daughter and her daughter was really like little, I don't know, three or four. And she had an identical twin sister in Russia. And when they went to meet the grandma and her at the airport, 
the daughter ran up to her and hugged her and said, mommy, because she was an identical twin and her mom was dead um, from this. So at the funeral, there was no one there. There was like five people there. So we would often do things like that. And so what I found out was when I realized whenever I went to funerals, even with either people I didn't know, or was like, I would just cry the whole time <laughs> just because I could never cry otherwise. So, uh, and, uh, or if it was like 90 year olds who, you know, had lived a good life um, that I did know, I would still cry. And I was like, geez. But I think part of it was I worked so hard not to cry uh, at yeah. every single thing uh, because I felt that was part of it. Um, I think that um, the other thing is I was always, I think part of this was because I was the first woman that ran for Senate. I got, it was unbelievable. I don't think this would happen today. Newspaper editors in small towns would say, can a woman win? Because we'd had two women lose um, for Senate who were both qualified in the years before I ran. And they literally say, do you think a woman could win? And I finally- I feel like we had that, we had that after Hillary well, lost, right? It still goes on, but this was, it, this, yeah. correct. And it went on, I think, in our presidential, I note that I think a lot of yeah. who had this like huge headwind that people thought a woman couldn't beat Donald Trump. It was in their heads um, right. when we were all running. And so I, uh, but I still, <laughs> I don't think I'd ever do this now, but I would just, I finally couldn't figure out, I'd be at these audiences, all these men, they kind of be like this. And I'd be like, it, you know, I'd be especially in the rural parts of our state. And I finally was asked this, can a woman win like in front of all of them? And I came up with this answer and I just go, look, yeah, you know, I'm not running as a woman. I'm running on my record and what I did and how I changed things and got things done as county attorney. I'm running on the strength of my ideas. Cause if I was just running as a woman and I still, it makes no real sense. If I was just running as a woman, I mean, half the voters are men and then I wouldn't, wouldn't win. And the men all go, yeah. <laughs> so I think part of it was kind of acknowledging you're not just running to be the woman senator, you know, right. you're, you're right. running for other things. So, and I still think it's a lesson to think about sometimes when you just double down on that so much of the first this, the first that, and then it starts making them think, is that the only reason you're doing this? Yeah. Um, and that's a legit question to ask, I think. And so um, I think that was part of my success with them. Um, and then my last story, I was at a steelworker event with a bunch of retired steelworkers. And there's this woman who raised her hand and she said, my name is Rose Bradovich. And I've never voted for a woman before because I think they should be home with their kids. But in oh. your case, I'm making an exception. And then every month she sent me $10, <laughs> Rose Bradovich. <laughs> But the funniest part is years later, I met the mayor, a woman, they had a woman mayor in that town. She goes, yep, that was the day I realized Rose Bradovich had never voted for me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, okay, let's see. We've got a couple more here. Um, this is a question from Anna. And she said, for girls who want to get involved in things like politics and change making, where would you recommend them to start? Um, well, you know, and this is for younger, I, I think just getting involved in any campaign is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And I just remind people, it does not have to be a presidential. It mm -hmm. can be on a city council race. My first one, I ran for a volunteer. I was a volunteer. So a, a city council race in the suburbs. And I learned all this stuff about putting up lawn signs and, you know, where you want to do things, main street corners. That guy was fine. He ended up winning and then he moved to Florida. <laughs> it's like a year later, he just left. So it, like, I'm only telling that story because it wasn't really that glamorous of a thing, but I, I learned from it. Then yes. you can pick candidates that don't move to Florida, actually. Um, I did like a reelect for a legislator. This was all volunteer stuff because I was a lawyer, yeah. I had student loans. I, so I was doing this as a volunteer. And then I got involved in a policy group that would talk about different policy ideas for Democrats and um, ended up heading it up eventually. So I just think you, and then I did a bunch of volunteer things that weren't political too. I, I think that you got to, um, not always think about the biggest race because sometimes you learn the most when you're doing some of the smaller things and then you move you move up now 
it's also fun, obviously, to be part of a bigger right. race. You can do both things, but I think that kind of thing is really important or get involved in an issue campaign of some kind yeah. that you care about and then that can lead. I just, I get concerned that if we just have people that think politics is yucky because it's so divisive and everything and it's not mm -hmm. easy right now, I will admit it. So I just got a text from a Republican senator who's a, a woman who's going to come over and have a drink with me when I'm done with this. <laughs> so, nice. I mean, it's it's like uh, it, it, there's a lot, especially in the Senate, there's a lot of friendships yeah. that are there. However, I think that um, despite the yuckiness of it, that if people just get so turned off that good people don't want to run, especially in these yeah. local you know, school board things, which we know are so important and that's bad. So people just are going to have to shoulder it, find people you agree with. They might even be, especially at the local level, sometimes in, depending on the district in suburban areas, rural areas, they might even be from the different party. But if you can find people who want to actually go into this for good and they want to actually govern and get things done, I mean, there is, yeah. a, go back to the theme, there's a joy in that when you find some common ground and ways to do this, as opposed to people who just want to disrupt and dismantle um, our government and representative democracy. Well, along those same lines, there's a question here from Caleb uh, about um, the strategies that you think are the most effective for kind of bridging the political divide and mm -hmm. fostering bipartisanship. Sure. Um, on issues. And I, I would add to that maybe, you know, if you think, you know, you mentioned a Republican, um, you know, female senator, if you feel that um, your colleagues, um, the other women in the Senate are particularly more apt to sort of come together um, in, a, yeah. in a bipartisan fashion um, so, to get things done. Yeah, I mean, the women in the Senate, they even did a study at Harvard that showed we were more likely to We'll be on each other's bills right. and work together and and when there was that one shutdown years ago we hope it's not you know prescient for yeah um it was actually susan collins and uh lisa murkowski and kelly Ayotte, myself gene shaheen there were a bunch of us that came together we let in john mccain okay but it was majority women that worked out this agreement at that time um and so but it's not just women for me the way you find mm -hmm. common ground is so, uh, issues that you both believe in. Um, I have worked with, you know, everything from Mike Lee on antitrust to uh, working with uh, Senator Kramer over in North Dakota on a firefighter bill. Um, uh, John Thune and I passed a big bill on shipping and supply chains during the pandemic. Um, and then you have just people you get to know from things so they trust you. You know, whether it is that women's senators group, whether it's the prayer breakfast group, whether it is uh, just from Midwestern for me or my little, you know, surrounding uh, states, I tend to work with them a lot, um, that you can find common ground on things. Um, so, you know, Dan Sullivan's a big Bono fan. You might not have known that, the center from <laughs> Alaska. And we were at the Munich Security Conference once and got to have dinner with Bono. Then that led us to go to the concert with Dan and his wife um, and meet with Bono again ahead of time, I actually end my book. This is not a hardship assignment you had there. No, no, no. That one was fun. <laughs> like, there, there are some fun things. But the point is, is that you find things that yeah. you can work with together, whether it's common interests, whether it's just basic friendships, trust. Um, it's really surprising on foreign aid, um, some of the centers who are actually more conservative, uh, who were involved in the prayer breakfast, you know, they tended to be stalwarts over in the past on the foreign aid issue. And Roy mm -hmm. Blunt and I have worked together on numerous things, including not just the inauguration, but on the Electoral Count Act reforms, on um, on tourism, on a we headed up the adoption caucus. And he is, is and was a really, really good friend that I trusted. And I think that made a huge difference um, mm -hmm. when we were able to work together during that nightmare of January 6th. And he was able to talk down some of the Republicans from objecting when we were all in that room, knowing we had to get this done before the sun rose, that after this insurrection, Americans didn't see us divided on the, um, on the electoral count. Um, by, you know, it would have lasted for days if he hadn't done that. And I worked with him to 
get it all sorted out, get people together. Or two weeks later, when we did that inauguration, there were a bunch of people that wanted to have it underground in a bunker. And we just right. both felt, as did President Biden, that that was wrong. And so when you think of Amanda Gorman, uh, the youngest inaugural poet ever in her bright yellow coat and the snow coming mm -hmm. down, I mean, you know, we wouldn't have had that moment and we wouldn't have had that joyous moment of uh, right. Lady Gaga robustly singing the Star Spangled Banner and pointing to the flag and saying, and our flag was still there. Those things happened, Garth Brooks with Amazing Grace, because Roy and I stood tall together and we convinced the center mm -hmm. to get all these security briefings and that this was run by a different group in a different way. Um, and so those things are, you know, they may be, maybe they're not things that you do every, you know, that take years to get done, but they're in the moment decisions that have to be based on trust that you're gonna do this together. You're gonna take responsibility for something together and you're gonna together convince your colleagues that it's the right thing to do. And now on the rules committee, the ranking, you're the chair and the ranking member is another woman, Deb Fisher. Exactly. And I think on appropriations too, there's uh, Susan yeah, Collins there's, uh, and, and Susan Patty Collins Murray, and right? Patty Murray have done incredible yeah. work in getting through all these appropriation bills. So we've had a number of examples. Deb was actually asked me to be her Democratic mentor when she got to the Senate. Um, she's a Republican senator from Nebraska. Uh -huh. So we work together a lot and we've had some um, really good hearings. We had the first over joint oversight hearing with the House of Representatives of the police, along with our Republican uh, counterparts, the Capitol Police uh, this summer, as well as our whole security apparatus after we made some major changes. Uh, we have, uh, we're working on some of the AI issues together, which is really mm -hmm. important for the future in elections. And as I noted, we um, shepherded well when Roy was there but with Deb's help shepherded through the electoral count act reform um we have a question you'll like this question this is from Grace um she says as, as a Minnesotan myself I see the great strides our state is making from universal school lunch to ensuring protected access to abortion what lessons do you think Congress can take from Minnesota very good. Well, um, our governor has done a great job and people have really focused on getting things done there. And I think one of the things, um, the school lunch, I'm a big fan of that, knowing what was going on in some of our rural areas. But I think one of the things I haven't talked about yet with that question leads me to um, is yeah. just a, a projection of a woman's decision to make her own decisions about her health care. That Dobbs decision, I think just rocked our country. People had just taken things for granted. And when you look at not just what happened in Minnesota, where we're an island of healthcare and that clinics have now closed down a clinic in North Dakota and moved over across the Red River to Minnesota. Um, but in states like Kansas and Ohio, uh, the, the state Supreme Court race in Wisconsin, um, you've just seen voters turn out uh, in unprecedented numbers to say, no, we want women to be able to make their own decision about their health care, not politicians. And mm -hmm. I think it really has perhaps taken some of our Republican colleagues by surprise. I don't know why, um, but it is, it's really been an extraordinary outpouring and continues to be because of the just wrongness of that decision um, and whether it's a a 10 year old in ohio that gets raped and victim and then can't get health care and has to go over to another state or whether it is a student whether it is whatever it is people have started to see this is just not the america that i want to live in and so it's um that i think has been a dramatic change not just in minnesota in terms of the people not taking it for granted anymore but mm -hmm but throughout the country. Um, Stephanie uh, is asking, um, she's from, she says, greetings from Atlanta. She said, uh, will we see a woman president in your lifetime? Uh, what's it going to take? Uh, well, I actually remember on the campaign trail saying if it would be easy, we could play a game called on the debate stage, name your favorite woman president. Oh, guess exactly. what? Exactly. Um, and so we now have Kamala Harris as our vice president, first woman vice president. Um, and um, I think we will see um, a woman president. I can't tell you when. I'm supporting President Biden, of course, as he seeks reelection. 
uh, but I, I think we will. Um, it just, when you look at other countries have had, <laughs> countries that have a much less of an electoral history, a democracy history than we do, have had uh, women in charge. So, and many of them doing really quite good jobs. And so my hope is that uh, we will see that. Yes. Um, Susan is asking if you would share your personal experience on uh, January 6th. Mm -hmm. So maybe some of you have seen the January 6th hearings and the video of uh, Speaker Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell and others that day. There was actually another room, uh, which was a room where uh, Senator Blunt and I were basically in charge. And that was everyone else in the Senate. So what happened was Roy and I worked together leading up to that. We know we had about 90 out of 100 senators voting to uphold the Electoral College. We were concerned. We didn't know there'd be an insurrection by any point, but we were concerned that this was gonna take a day to two days. And I warned our colleagues. I had as anything with pomp and circumstance type things where we walk with the electoral ballots in these mahogany mm -hmm. boxes that are held by three pairs of young women. Um, that day, we I was very focused on the speaking order and I was speaking after Ted Cruz who was objecting. It was Senator Schumer and McConnell and then he, I believe, then he was objecting and then I was going next. And that was all before the insurrection started. And I actually said that day that I called the people that were voting to uphold the votes, the coup fighters, not knowing that this was going to happen because the other side of it was so dark. And so we did that. Then all of a sudden, as everyone knows, the Pence is let out. He was presiding over the Senate. And then we were taken to this other room. And um, I remember Tim Scott got up and uh, there was a prayer and then Roy and I got up and we said we had both I had talked to Chuck he had talked to Mitch and that no matter what happened that we were going to be going back that night and everyone cheered what we were taking back our chamber because at that point you could see the insurrectionists on the TVs that were in this room that right. were um, that showed them then the day goes on and I remember, you know, we working on these objections, we're talking to Chuck and Mitch that are in the other room, we're giving the senators reports of what's happening. Um, and then an officer came in and said someone, I still don't know who had put up a picture of us in that room that was on Facebook. And you could kind of tell they said the officer did what the room was. He had all these cuts on his face and, and they kept mm. having me make announcements. I get up there and I'm like, do you wanna have your face look like his face? because we don't have enough officers here right now, which wasn't public because it was just chaos. Right. Apart. And I said, so we've got 90 of the senators here and <laughs> take that Facebook page picture down right now. Uh, I still don't know who it was, but they all thought I knew who it was. So I guess that was good. Um, and so then um, other things happened. We didn't have enough food. So I instructed after the instructions had left, but they hadn't cleared the building. I took in some um staff members and some of the cops and i'm like you got to go in the dirksen cafeteria i don't care we'll deal with it later but i need you to basically take food out of there use those hospital things one thing i i didn't say in the book that i said i go if those glass doors because i was worried the centers were going to leave and it wasn't safe and they hadn't eaten right. for like six hours and as my husband notes they were not the age to pull an all-nighter and so i'm <laughs> like if there if you can't get in those glass um, if those, if you can't get in the glass doors where those salads and sandwiches are, I go, just break the glass. You have my permission, but don't get any glass in the food. <laughs> it's like, you know, like a half hour, they had the food. And I still remember a very prominent center who I will not reveal eating a big sandwich and said to me, how did you get this selection? <laughs> you know, so Who's your great we all, we all go back, we all go back and then uh, we have these really dramatic speeches. If you ever want to mm -hmm. see something, watch the speeches Democrats mm -hmm. and Republicans made about upholding our democracy that night. And so that we may have a set order. We talk down more, uh, multiple objections. And by four in the morning, everyone's gone home except Vice President Pence, who was talking about it on their debate stage, Vice President Pence and Senator Blunt and me and the three pairs of women with these mahogany boxes and, of course, security. Mm -hmm. and and we walk this time, not with a celebration with the whole Senate following us, but we're going over broken glass. We've got spray painted pillars. And then we end up in the house where a number of 
uh, reps were there. Um, Speaker Pelosi was there. And then we announced, we went through all the ballots and we got to the end to Wyoming. And then we announced that um, Biden and Harris had won. I did it and then actually Vice President Pence did it as well, mm -hmm. made that announcement. Um, and then Roy and I walked back and he said, we should go down and look at these, uh, the parliamentarian's office, which they had targeted first. They targeted the inaugural platform, the parliamentarian's office, because they literally wanted to steal the ballots. And they, they um, had just, I remember seeing one of the dearly beloved parliamentarian members of staff, her family picture broken on the floor mm. um, and yeah. we just looked and Roy and I walked out the sun's coming up and he just I remember in his understated way he's like well I'll see you in the morning I'm gonna have a lot of work to do I go wow yeah. and so then we started planning the inauguration at that next day um, which yeah. we had, of course doing for a year but this yeah. was like we had a we had to now plan it in light of all of this um, right and, right well, thank you for sharing that. And I guess as the last question you okay. had mentioned um, in the book, you said at the very, at the end, you say, I go forward with, with this job with a spring in my step to a tune that's not yet finished. Yes. So I guess I'll ask you sort of what is your, what's your next tune? Uh, will you run for, do you think you'll run, make another run for the presidency? Well, as I said, I'm supporting uh, President Biden. I'm actually running for yeah. my Senate re-election, and that's what I'm focused on. I'm in leadership in the Senate, and there's just so there's the obvious big things that we need to do on everything from workforce training and, in my mind, immigration reform because you no know, great nation has it expanded with the shrinking workforce. Um, and uh, the work that we need to do on climate and so many other things. Um, and including what's right in front of us, the farm bill, the defense bill, other things. Um, but I still find that joy in, in um, accomplishments for people at home. I just think I visited 27 counties and working with my colleagues. I was happy to see them when I got back mm -hmm. yesterday. Um, and So you know, would, you, would you want to succeed Schumer as leader? Oh, I am running for Senate re-election. Chuck Schumer is doing a great job as leader. And All everything right. Everything is good in the world. All right. Well, Senator, we really appreciate you spending some time with us and um, sharing all of your wisdom and lessons and your encouragement for other women in politics. And uh, we appreciate everybody watching tonight. And we will uh, stay in touch with you all and some other Women on Wednesday events we have coming up this semester. Um, but thanks again for joining us tonight. Okay. Thank you.